Hello, welcome to this NMC OSCE tutoring video. My name is Hannah. I'm a UK registered nurse and a university lecturer, and I've been an NMC OSCE programme lead. And I also provide independent one to one and small group OSCE training for internationally educated nurses. So I am continuing with my API series of videos. This is where we look at one of the API scenarios, and I'm going to talk through a little bit about the condition, so you know about the condition, the main um, signs and symptoms, so you know what to expect potentially when you go into that scenario. Um, key assessment priorities, so what are, go are going to be our assessment priorities in our assessment station and in our holistic assessment? What could be potential areas that we can do a care plan for? What are some of the common and key medications for this presentation and in the NMC OSCE? And thinking about some of those key recommendations we can use in the recommendations section of our evaluation. So we're going to start today and we're going to be looking at the subdural hematoma. So for adult OSCE nurses, you've obviously got your 12 potential API scenarios and subdural hematoma is one of those API scenarios that you can get. So what is a subdural hematoma? So it's when a hematoma or blood clot forms um, between the dura mater and the brain and it gathers in that kind of inner lining um, of the dura mater and the anacroid matter. And it's normally because there's been some tearing or damage to those bridging veins that sit within the subdural space. So most common causes are trauma to the head. And um, one of the very common causes is falls in the elderly population who are on blood thinners, anticoagulants. And that is relevant because that is normally the history and background for our scenario in the NMC exam. You can also get them in chronic alcoholism due to shrinkage of the brain, um, and then you get tearing of those bridging um, veins as well. And you can get a chronic subdural, so something that has um, developed slowly over time, and an acute subdural where you've had that instant trauma and then that um, very rapid bleeding. So sign and symptoms, what would we expect to see in someone that's got subdural? So they would have either a loss of consciousness or a reduced level of consciousness. And we see this in our NMC um, scenario because the patient is normally confused. So they have got a GCS of 14 instead of 15. They will often have a headache um, and be accompanied with vomiting and no nausea. So you've got an increased intracranial pressure because of the subdural bleeding and that can trigger um, vomiting and nausea. It can also trigger seizures and they might have a, a one-sided weakness. So normally on the opposite side to where the clot is forming, then you might get a weakness or a total hemiplegia in the left or right side. So those are some of the very common symptoms and some of the things that we should be expecting to see in our NMC OSCE scenario. Not the seizures, but definitely reduced conscious level, headache, vomiting, and a potential one-sided weakness. So what's the treatment? So we need to do a CT scan to confirm. And then primary treatment, um, depending on the size, is surgery. So they can go and have a craniotomy, so um, removal of the bone, removal of the blood clot, and then we pop the bone back in. Or we can do burr holes, um, so you can kind of drill in and release the blood clot that way. And small subdural hematomas can be conservatively managed, so we don't need to do any treatment. Um, we can just um, sit and, and watch and wait and the body will naturally kind of just um, break down the clot and it will get um, removed that way. So those are for your small subdural hematomas where there hasn't been a dramatic change or in conscious level. So in your NMC OSCE scenario, this is always a hospital-based scenario and the patient actor is often confused with the GCS of 14. So when you're going into that scenario, you should be prepared for that. So it's important we reorientate the patient actor, reassure them um, you know, that they're safe, reorientate them to, to the hospital and the time and, and just show that level of empathy. Um, it's important. So like I said, what could you expect in your scenario? So you can definitely expect to have a patient that's confused and disorientated, like I said, that they've got pain and headache, um, a history of falls. Um, so often, well, normally the um, patient has had a fall at home and been brought in. Um, they might be having vomiting and nausea. And again, thinking about that social history that we get, um, we want to start thinking about kind of the home environment, you know, is the home environment triggering falls? No, are there lots of steps? Are there parts that are inaccessible? Um, thinking about what support is available in home as well from relatives, you know, family um, or support that's coming in in terms of kind of care packages potentially. 
So time management. So if you have got the subdural hematoma station, you have to complete a full GCF as well as your A to E assessment. So you need to get through your A to E assessment a little bit quicker to give you time to do your full GCS. So I break the station down, do my key principles, in okay, case so of all your safety, um, privacy, hands, introduce yourself, ID checks, allergy checks, um, and then get onto your A to assessment. Remember, I always advocate doing your A to assessment, which includes your vital signs, it shouldn't be separate. Um, and working through your A to assessment, you still need to prioritize your A to assessment, an issue in airway, we need to know before an issue in um, disability. And then when you get to disability, instead of doing that ACPU poo, you're going to do that full GCS. So that's your um, eye response, nerve response, motor response, your pupils, reaction to light, and your limb strength. And I've got a separate video which explains in detail the GCS, um, how to complete your GCS and how to chart it as well. So go and check out that video if you haven't watched it. You need to document all your observations on the GCS chart. You won't have the news 2 chart and you need to verbalise your monitoring and escalation in relation to that patient's GCS score. And again, that's all on my GCS video, which you need to learn for your OSCE. Then I would go on to complete my holistic assessment and then finish and end my station professionally. So key nursing priorities, like I said, you're going to continue to do your A to assessment. You still need to do airway, breathing, circulation, disability exposure. It remains exactly the same. You're going to, within that, monitor and record your vital signs. You're going to do your full GCS and you need to verbalise your GCS monitoring. OK, so whatever your total GCS is, you're going to need to monitor your um, verbalise your monitoring frequency. So if the GCS is 14 or less, which it is very often is, then you're going to be monitoring that patient every 30 minutes until their GCS reaches a score of 15. If their GCS is 15 and they've got a history of their head injury, then you should be monitoring their GCS half hourly for two hours then one hourly for four hours and then two hourly. And that is the nice guidelines and um, recommendations. And that's what you need to follow and learn for your OSCE. Um, so assessment priorities, obviously, like I said, GCS monitoring, we want to make sure that patient is not deteriorating neurologically. If they're deteriorating, that clot is expanding and the increased intracranial pressure, which is obviously a um, uh, you know, very... Um, uh, life-threatening situation okay so we want to be doing that GCS monitoring we might also we also want to be picking up on a holistic assessment the history of falls um so identifying maybe how many falls they've had in the last three months you know if they can remember the cause of the falls are they using any mobility aids are there onward referrals we need to do in terms of physiotherapy occupational therapy we're going to assess pain in disability um so we just want to make sure that we are fully understanding the level and nature of pain and the headache. And, you know, we might also, if we've got time, be thinking about fluid input and output and thinking about that risk of dehydration as well. The patient is, is being sick um, and potentially could be nil by mouth in preparation for theatre. Um, psychosocial, so again, you want to be evaluating the living situation. So reading your information off your briefing, thinking about the accessibility of the home, you know, what support services are in place? Is there any family nearby that are supporting? You know, thinking about their emotional well-being. So are they feeling particularly low mood or anxious about anything? Remember, your patient actor will be confused. So offering that constant reassurance and reorientation is really important. Are there any relatives that we need to be contacting? Spiritual and sexual, again, very brief with this because of time, but just check in how we've got any spiritual or cultural needs whilst we're in hospital. And then sexual, finding out about support network, um, you know, are they, they've got a partner, are they married, are they supportive, um, has there been a recent bereavement, we need to pick that up, you know, who is their kind of support ne network, their friends and the family, um, and looking at it from that perspective. So we think about planning, so there's lots of things we could plan for in the station, but um, a key one could potentially be, you know, the risk of neurological deterioration due to, you know, Mary having the subdural hematoma. And our aim would be to reduce the risk of any further deterioration and to identify quickly any changes in GCS. The realization time frame for this would be every 30 minutes. And that's because we are, if the GCS is 14, we are monitoring it every 30 minutes until the GCS is 15. So that's why we've got a 30 minute time frame in there. And some possible interventions. This is not exhaustive, and I've kind of um, shortened these sentences to, you know, get them onto the slide. And um, so think about your answers fully. But obviously, going to explain to Mary the plan of care and gain consent. 
Um, monitoring vital signs is really important in someone with a head injury um, because it can indicate signs of increased intracranial pressure. So we want to be monitor monitoring those vital signs, you know, specifically heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate and escalating those. We're also going to be assessing and recording Mary's GCS every 30 minutes until it is GCS 15. We're going to be assessing Mary for signs of any worsening hemorrhage. So this could be an increase in headache, increase in confusion, neurological deficits so an increased weakness um, or reduced movement in one side. Um, those could be signs as well. Increased um, vomiting, nausea as well. We want to administer any prescribed medication and particularly any anticoagulant reversal medication. So if your patient scenario is on blood thinners due to atrial fibrillation, for example, or a previous stroke, we want to be reversing those blood thinners. We'd want to nurse Mary at 30 degrees, so like a head up position, this helps promote venous drainage and also helps reduce um, intracranial pre pressure. And we want to support and reassure Mary and reorientate her to time, place and person. And we're going to document all our care. So that's just a little kind of condensed example of a potential care plan. Other care plans you can do, which would be really relevant, obviously pain, really standard care plan, which you should definitely prep in advance for all your API scenarios. The patient's going to have headache. And there's also risk of falls. So we can do a risk of falls care plan in the hospital, thinking about reducing or minimising the risk of falls in hospital and thinking about all those things around safe mobilisation that we can do. Implementation. So you're most probably have some analgesics because the patient's in pain, so paracetamol. You might have codeine phosphate written up. This is contraindicated in the BNF for a patient with head injury, so you shouldn't really be given um, codeine phosphate. So this would be a clear contraindication. And that's because codeine phosphate, um, very simple pharmacology, can break down into morphine um, and therefore can um, reduce someone's kind of alertness and conscious level um, due to morphine. So we don't want to be doing that in someone with a head injury because um, we don't know then if they've deteriorated because of uh, the worsening head injury or because of the morphine. You might have some anti-emetics, so some anti-sickness drugs, so those are good things to look up, so your cyclosine, metoclopramide. Um, the NMC scenario has three medications which are normally give, given. They're a little bit bizarre in the management of this patient and maybe not something that we'd give all together all at the same time, but this is what the scenario is. So uh, there is pyrosamide, which is a diuretic. Um, there is bisoprolol, which is a beta blocker, and then a tenolol, which is an antihypertensive. And um, we wouldn't necessarily give all of those all together to someone with a head injury because you're going to have quite a marked drop in blood pressure, which is not always a good thing because you won't, you'll get some ischemia to the brain potentially. Anyway, those are some key meds which are on the chart which you normally have to give. So they're good ones to prep um, and look up in your BNF. There might be some other drugs written on your chart which are not due for you to give, okay, but are there, so it is good to have a bit of awareness. So one could be warfarin. This patient could be on warfarin as a normal regular medication, um, but again, that would be contraindicated in acute bleeding, so we would withhold that. And they might have had some drugs to um, reverse um, the anticoagulant, for example, so vitamin K and things such as Beriplex. You might see those on the drug chart. You wouldn't um, be administering them, but you might see them, so just verbalise, you know, that they might have already been administered, for example. But just so you're aware of some of those things that can pop up on the drug, drug chart. And then evaluation. So it depends, um, again, who you're evaluating to, what the current state of your patient is. Normally, and I say normally because I know things change, but normally the patient has improved. So their GCS is now 15. And you're handing over to the nurse or you're transferring them to a, you know, a ward for further um, no observation. So, um, again, I'm just going to go through the recommendations because all the other part of your SBAR, you will have that information present from your stations. So things we want to think about the nurse doing would be, obviously, your main area of concern is they've got a subdural hematoma and they are still at risk of neurological deterioration. Things you want that nurse to continue doing. So to continue to assess the GCS. And again, it depends on your scenario. If they increase their GCS to 15, they need to be monitored every 30 minutes for two hours every hour for four hours and then every two hours. You want to, that nurse to continue to monitor and record the vital signs. You'd want them to continue to assess the headache and administer any analgesic as prescribed as well. You'd want them to continue to monitor fluid input and output. Um, 
And you'd want to chase up maybe um, full up any referrals that you've implemented in your care plan. So if you've um, implemented things such as physio, OT, you might also want to add in there about, you know, promoting safe mobilisation. And if you've done a risk of falls care plan, you know, you might want them to continue to put into place as measures to reduce the risk of falls. So when you're thinking about your recommendations and your evaluation, think about all those things you'd want that other nurse or oncoming nurse to do for your patient. So my top tips with the subdural um, hematoma API is to learn how to complete your GCS and familiarise and practice using the GCS observation chart because you won't have the news to. And I've got a separate video where I explain about that in detail. So please go and watch that. Practice this assessment station to time because it takes a little bit longer um, to complete. So you want to be able to comfortably get through that station to time. Um, learn your verbalisation for your GCS monitoring frequency. OK, so learn that. Um, you know what if their GCS is 14 we're going to monitor them every 30 minutes um I practice writing your care plans so it's a, a really good thing because you know what the key things this condition are going to be because we know how these patients present you can prep and plan a lot of your care plans in advance and review and learn your key medications hope that's helpful um I do small group tutoring or one-to-one -one. um um, for your OSCE and I've got lots of resources as well which I can give you I can just do mock OSCEs as well and I do a lot of um, second and third attempt support for those that have trained as well self-studied and then find themselves in a second and third attempt um, situation as well so please feel free to contact me and at our aims at outlook.com please like subscribe and share my videos um, and thanks for all your comments I try and answer them as much as I can um, if you've got any questions and queries as well